I like the moment before a cubby rise, when those dogs go from kinetic energy and freeze into granite. Everything's just potential energy and you're watching the powder burn into the powder keg and you're just waiting for that explosion. Anything that happens after that, knocking holes in the sky, pillowcase and birds, doesn't matter beyond that. But watching that somewhat of a symphony of bird dogs casting across the drainage to absolutely locking up and just the tension that is in the air before those birds explode. It's watching the dice tumble, watching the cards being dealt and having no idea what you have. I feel like when I walk through these hills, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know if it's an omnipotent power or it just feels right like a hand sliding into a well-fit glove. My name is Robert Poor. I live in Southern Arizona and I love upland bird hunting and following my dogs. I used to go with my dad a lot. We were one of the few rednecks that had four-wheelers, so we would load up on that. He would cradle me in his lap. I'd have a little pop gun, and he'd have a Browning Satori and a gun rack that he had fashioned on the front rack of that four-wheeler. And then when he'd go off and chase birds, I would stay at the four-wheeler, stay real close. That transition into carrying a 410 and um, him getting me on my first gambles bird. I remember being shocked of the gun going off, but he went and picked it up and walked it back to me, and I just remember super shady spot under a hackberry tree and he handed it to me and he had a smile from ear to ear and he shook my hand. But he didn't grab me up, he didn't hug me, he didn't do anything like that. He reached out his hand and made me shake his hand and he congratulated me. And from that point on it transitioned into being a participant. I was carrying a gun, I had my own bird vest. I was playing the game now. I remember during dove season getting up before the school bus would show up, walking around literally the front yard and whacking doves on the ground and getting two or three and being super happy about that, getting cleaned up, going on the bus to school. Looking back on it, you, you don't realize it's odd until you compare it to other people's background. There was not necessarily like t-ball trophies or anything hanging out on, on coffee tables, but there was, you know, elk heads on the wall and guns everywhere. <laughs> My name is Robert Poor, and this is a small look into my collection of shotguns. This is my Browning Auto 5. It was my father's gun. I inherited it. I don't shoot it much anymore, but it does shoot a few doves and a few sandhill cranes. This is an Ithaca SKB Model 100. This is my main 20 gauge quail gun. This is a Connecticut Shotguns RBL 16 gauge. This is my main 16 gauge bird gun. As far as rituals before I hunt, I do have a playlist that I listen to before every hunt. Right before we get out of the truck, Cowboys from Hell from Pantera. Another one that has been successful in the past is Rolling in the Deep by Adele. I play them before we've had good days and I play them before we have bad days. I just forget the bad days. The desert southwest, we have special creatures down here that don't exist anywhere else in the world. Predominant pokey things down here, predominant one is going to be mesquite. You have multiple species of agaves and then all the various forms of cactus. Another one is devil's claw. They actually use their pokiness as a seed dispersal mechanism as opposed to defense. They have really nice hooks that'll hook onto your feet and as you go on about your business not realizing they're attached to you, they'll disperse their seeds. If you're a birder, this is a birding mecca. We have Mern's quail, which are incredibly near and dear to my heart. Fanatic about chasing wild turkeys. It's the funnest thing you can do with pants on. Dove season, September 1, is when we really get ramped up. Kind of some forest grouse stuff. And then our quail seasons are starting. I'll be doing that. I found a, a job that allows me to kind of not work, because the only thing better than working is not. I put in my time, I uh, make sure that the lights are on and the bills are paid, and then I kind of hood right around the, the desert with friends and, and bird dogs.
upland hunter is, is anybody doing this that has the common love of the birds, the places, the dogs and the guns. My favorite breed of dog, I haven't found it yet. Nice dogs in every breed and there's real turds in every breed. Everybody thinks they have the best dog and they're right. Uh, I have a English cocker named Bart. He is a coked out monkey with a switchblade. He goes by, uh, well, uh, a couple of things. So I refer to him as El Barto a lot. That was a, a alter ego of Bart Simpson back in the early 90s, El Barto. That's how he tagged his name. Then he also goes by BBC, which is Bart the Black Cocker. Yeah. I have an English setter. His name is Luke, uh, paper name Cool Hand Luke. He runs with a joy that I am not used to seeing. It, it takes what is already super exciting for me and just, we found a new notch above that. He kind of just got saddled with Lucas. That's all we've got right now for him, but I sing it when I talk to him. I think a lot of times he's just out there and when you sing it out there, Lucas, it carries a little bit better and I can get him turned for me. So we don't have anything too mouthful for him because it would be wasted on a dog at 300 yards. I have a Brock Francaise Pyrenean. Her name is Opal. Paper name is Little Opal Annie. She is a different dog when I drop her in the field versus at home. In the field, I can hardly get her to look at me. She's pretty business oriented. And then on the other side of that, when I get her home, she doesn't have much interest in doing anything before 8 a.m. or after 8 p.m. Her main nickname is Booger, or sometimes that gets lengthened to Booger Bear. But when, when it's business time, it's, it's Opal or Booger. Yeah. I will have multiple dogs in my lifetime, but I'm the only person in that dog's entire life. I don't have any kids. Those dogs are my family. They are my kids. I largely hunted by myself or with a very, very few close friends for years and years and years and years and years. Started sharing some of that success and, and some of those great times on, on social media platforms. The way that the memes got started is um, there was a couple of us kind of firing them back and forth for just our enjoyment of, of, you know, three or four friends. And then it just kind of spiraled into a thing where other people were seeing our posts on like Facebook and Instagram and enjoying it. I think there's absolutely times to be serious and passionate in this venue. And there's also times to just laugh at knocking holes in the sky. It's just my coping mechanism, and it adds a little sparkle to the day to make some, some strangers on the internet laugh every now and again. And it's, I think, foreign to a lot of folks that are from other parts of the country to look out at this landscape and, and see something so different than what they know. If we can share little slivers of that, you know, with, with a photo of me and my dogs working in some unknown corner of this, this, this part of the world and intrigue interest in them for, hey, what, how do those birds behave? What kind of plants are gonna get me while I'm there? I'm thinking about coming out. Maybe it starts a friendship where, where we go out together. I don't know what caused the turning over a leaf. I don't know if it was time moving on, the not having kids. I, ha I have no idea why, but I felt a change in the way that I approach the community and folks that are interested in doing this. And I figure if they can see my sliver of the way that I do this, not saying that my way is the best way, it's just my way. But if they can see my sliver of this and the appreciation of it, and we can, we can enjoy a couple good covey rises together, that still leaves another two or three hours of walking that I can plant earwigs and uh, show them why this is important and why it's worth appreciating and saving and taking care of. If I take somebody and they really enjoyed it and it's worth them doing again, and they take a few folks and it, it just kind of starts to turn into the force multiplying just a branch out tree kind of a thing. It seems like you're a little bit like the devil's claw. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how that was going to boomerang. There's a man who sits alone. The only way to keep any of this going is if we share with somebody tomorrow. And tomorrow being 
literally tomorrow to infinity. If I don't share what I know, it could end with me. The fact that we have the resources that we do to meet strangers from across the country with a common interest, and then maybe pass on those, those little nuggets here and there of, of things that I appreciate. I'm trying to get people to experience and embrace what we enjoy about this. I'm a firm believer in leaving the country better than you found it. Whether you're leaving your mark is volunteering with the Quail Forever chapter and building rock gabions in this part of the world, or as simple as picking up a piece of trash that you see on the ground. That's all making things better, and that's all stuff that we can do while getting to enjoy the country. You get to go out there and experience it, and if you can leave it just a little bit better, then we're each taking hand and having something for tomorrow.